Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa lah, amma ba'ad. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. So, uh, last week we had finished up with the ayah, ayah number 11 in Surah Al-Buruj. Just a reminder, Allah Ta'ala says what? Ba'ad of Shalajim. Inna al-ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihati lahum jannatun tajri min tahtiha al-anhar, thalika al-fawzu al-kabir. So Allah Subh'ana Ta'ala was speaking about the believers going to paradise. Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deeds will have gardens beneath which rivers flow. This is the great attainment. So Allah Subh'ana Ta'ala is enticing the believers and letting them know that for your suffering and for whatever persecution you go through, Allah is going to reward you. Now Allah Ta'ala changes the topic and focuses on the actual criminals and their punish and, and the punishment and what they will receive. Because obviously the question comes when, when believers are going through hard times and when they're being oppressed by the oppressor, they're wondering, isn't God angry with this person? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in response, the very next ayah, ayah number 12, Inna batsha rabbika la shadeed. Indeed the batsh, and we're going to translate that in a second, but here it says, indeed the vengeance of Rabbika, of your Lord, is la shadid, is indeed severe. So we can break this down in a few ways. First of all, there's a inna, which is emphasizer. And there's a lam of the lam ta'akid. There's a lam which is also stressing. So it's as if this is a very, like, indeed, for sure, without a doubt, it's a very highly stressed uh, statement. Inna batasha Rabbika la shadid. So why is there so, so much added emphasis? Because the obvious point is what? That we don't see Allah's punishment happening immediately. When you see tyrants getting away with their criminal behavior and you don't see their punishment immediately, you start to doubt Allah's anger towards these people. Why aren't you getting rid of them immediately? But a delay doesn't mean something is never coming, right? Obviously, we know that if something is delayed, it doesn't mean that that thing is never coming. And we know, obviously, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala executes His plan according to His own wisdom, not according to our timing. Just because you are mad doesn't mean Allah Ta'ala is going to say, okay, drop the big plan and we're just going to do what you want, right? That doesn't work like that. That's not the way life works. So Allah Ta'ala is, 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 is reminding and uh, reassuring the believer that, of course, I despise uh, oppression and injustice. Inna batasha rabbika la shadid. That Allah's, uh, and so the word batsh itself usually means to seize violently. To seize al uh, 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 you know, to, to see something uh, with, 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 with violently and angrily. So Allah is saying, what? Indeed, my punishment, when I seize the, the disbelievers, I, it will be a la uh, shadid, it will indeed be severe. So this is a reassurance to the believers that no, they will not get away with their injustice. But what's also very fascinating about this ayah is that Allah refers to himself, refers to God as what? Rabbika, your Lord. This is now bringing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu who was receiving this revelation into the conversation. Because prior to this, you didn't see that the Prophet was being mentioned. And now you're saying, in, uh, 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 before it was talking about what? The story of those who were burned alive, those who were killed for their beliefs, for, for believing in God. And how the tyrant ruler did not accept this, these people's uh, faith. And so now Allah Ta'ala is turning, this is called iltifat in the Arabic language. Iltifat means switching, you know, you could say the attention and bringing it now to a new individual. Inna batasha rabbika, O Muhammad, your Lord is very severe in punishment. And his, uh, when he seizes this disbelievers, it's very harsh. So why is Allah Ta'ala now turning his attention and speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The conversation is turned to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an indirect message to the Quraysh, saying what? This is my Prophet, so don't mess with him. Why? Because my punishment is very severe. It's happened before and it can happen again. It might not happen immediately, but you better watch out because obviously everybody dies and everybody's going to be resurrected. So this is a very, very severe uh, warning to the disbelievers. It's also very similar to the ayah, وَكَذَلِكَ أَخْذُ رَبِّكَ إِذَا أَخَذَ الْقُرَىٰ وَهِيَ ظَالِمَةٌ إِنَّ أَخْذَهُ الْأَلِيمُ الْأَلِيمُ الشَّدِيدُ Allah says, and thus is the seizure of your Lord uh, when, he, uh, when he seizes, again, your Lord, speaking of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he seizes the cities while they are committing wrong. Indeed, his seizure is painful and severe. So yes, this isn't just a statement about Allah's anger for the criminals, it's also a statement about Allah's protectiveness over the believers. So we're seeing that element here as well. And this is reminiscent of the Hadith Qudsi, in which Allah Ta'ala says, uh, what? Man li waliyan faqad bil harb. That I will declare war against anybody who shows hostility towards a pious worshiper of mine. Anybody who is an enemy to one of my believing, worshiping slaves, I will announce what? I will declare harb, war to that individual. SubhanAllah, very, very uh, powerful hadith Qudsi. Now, moving on. So Allah Ta'ala mentions his anger. What's the very next ayah? Innahu huwa yubadi'u wa yu'eed. Allah says what? Indeed, it is he. Now, what's interesting here is how many times Allah is being stressed. Because Allah could have said, yubadi'u wa yu'eed. He begins and he repeats. 
or he, he begins something and then he brings it back. Right? So why not? Why? Inna hu, huwa yubadi wa yu'id. Allah Ta'ala is being stressed over and over again. So this is a very, again, an emphatic statement. Now, this verse can mean what? That number one, the most obvious is what? That Allah is the one who created us. This life is Allah's creation. The idea that the disbelievers are in charge and taking care of or, or going to punish you and do this to you, do that to you, they're not really in charge. That is all what? That is all just in the very temporary, that is all short term. Ultimately, Allah is the one who created this test called life. This whole life is a test. And Allah is the one who what? Yubadi'u. That He began this life and guess what? Yes, the disbelievers may do terrible things and yes, people may die. Well, you read, but He's going to bring everybody back and everybody's going to stand for Judgment Day. That seems to be the, uh, the, the primary understanding of this ayah. It's a reminder that life is a brief test. So, so uh, don't determine success or failure through, wor through a worldly lens. Don't think that success or failure is only through worldly means. This is just the temporary world. In the next life, we get to find out who are the true winners and who are the true losers based on their faith and their goodness, etc. Another interpretation, however, is what? That Allah is saying, Inna hu huwa yubadi wa that indeed He is the one who originates and then He repeats. What does that mean? It's referring to what? Referring back to the adab al hariq, the, the burning punishment. Why? Because we know that those disbelievers, one of the interpretations of this uh, surah is that uh, Qurtubi, he mentions it, we talked about this before, that Qurtubi talks about what? How these people, they started a really big fire and started throwing the believers in it. The thing is the fire got out of control, it burned the city and it killed them. And it killed them, they burned in a fire, and then Allah is saying what? Innahu huwa yubadi'u, he is the one who began the fire. You think you're in control? No, he's the one who began the fire. Wa yu'id, and he's going to repeat it. In other words, you died from this fire, but guess what? You're going to be resurrected on uh, Judgment Day, and then you're going to be thrown into a different fire. So he, he's the one who started it, he's going to repeat it as well. That you will be burned a second time. A third interpretation is that this is talking about circumstances. We know that circumstances can change. Sometimes you're going through good times and sometimes you're going through bad times. Sometimes the enemies are winning and sometimes you're beating your enemies. So it goes back and forth. And this could be a reference to that. Look, this is the way life goes. This is very similar to the ayah where Allah says, That, and these are the days, these days of varying conditions. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. These are the days we alternate amongst people. Things are constantly changing. So you have to be uh, okay with that fact. You're not always going to win just because you're a good person, just because you're a believer. The way Allah made this dunya, the way Allah made this world, is how it has a cyclical nature to it. We see that the water cycle, water goes up, it evaporates, then it falls down in terms of rain. We just saw that today, alhamdulillah. We see this through the seasons. We see this in terms of day and night coming and going. Always there's this cyclical nature. Same thing with birth and death. Same thing with victory and loss. It has this cyclical nature. And a fourth interpretation of this ayah is what? After mentioning Allah's severe punishment, a disbeliever might think that death will be their escape, right? Allah is saying, I'm going to see you, like, you know, like, you know, the way Fir'aun was drowned, or the way uh, the people of different, different groups were, were killed and seized. They might think, okay, Allah might punish me, but then at least it's over. But Allah is saying, what? After mentioning that my punishment is severe, I can punish you in dunya, but guess what? He's the one who begins the punishment, and then he can bring it back. This is, again, a reference to the afterlife, threat, a threat to the disbelievers who are doing such heinous crimes. Yes, so a disbeliever might think that death will be their escape. So Allah clarifies that even if you die, you'll be returned. And upon realizing this, the disbeliever might sincerely fear Allah's wrath, hence the next verse. Hopefully, they have a wake-up call, and then Allah says, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ Right? He is the one who is all forgiving and all loving, the most loving. So this is, now that you realize there's no escape, if you cling to your evil, if you cling to your sin, and think, oh, that's okay, I can just escape Allah's punishment. Once I die, it's over. It's not over. Allah said, Ta'ala says, I can bring you back again. We even know the nature of hellfire, that those who are burning in hell, even if their flesh roasts off, it will come back so that they can be burned once again. Otherwise, it would just be a one-time burn and then it would be over very, very quickly. So we know that this is the case, that no. And this is supposed to scare you so that you what? Turn back to Allah in repentance and Allah says, He is the one who is all forgiving and all loving. As long as you turn to Him, inshallah ta'ala, no matter how great, no matter how big your sins are, Allah ta'ala will forgive because Allah is the all-forgiving. And a uh, fifth interpretation, uh, and Allah knows best, but it's still quite an interesting one, is what? That this is talking about what? Uh, Allah's anger is severe towards the disbelievers. Allah's anger is severe towards the believers. Why? Because He is the one who sends revelation. I'm the one who sent guidance to begin with. And you people keep trying to snuff it out. You people keep trying to destroy the truth. And when you see believers acting in accordance with the truth, you try to throw them into fires and kill them too. You want to delete the truth. So what does he have to do? He has to send new messengers. Well, you read, he has to bring it back again and again. And this is why Allah Ta'ala had to keep sending new messengers. We believe that Adam, the first man, was the first prophet. If people held on to the truth, 
you never have to need, you, you, you never need more prophets. Why? Because they just believed in Allah, they, they worshiped, they became good people. There's no need for new revelation. Just keep on being good believers. But every time people try to destroy and distort the truth and destroy the believers, what happens? Allah Ta'ala has to send new revelation, new prophets to clarify what the truth is again and again and again. So after saying, my punishment is severe and my, my anger towards these disbelievers is severe. Why? Because I'm the one who begins and I have to repeat. In other words, I begin with this revelation and I repeat it over and over again. Why? Because you guys keep destroying it. SubhanAllah. So this is another way of uh, 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 interpreting these, these ayat. And it's also interesting because this can also be a threat to the Quraysh. Allah is saying what? I'm going to bring back the truth to Mecca. Mecca was a place of Tawheed. Mecca was built by who? Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi uh, salam. May, Allah, may Allah's peace and blessing be upon both of them, Abraham and Ishmael. And so Allah is saying what? I'm going to bring this back. Well, you eat, I'm going to bring it back. So you people are going to be obsolete very soon. These disbelievers. Then what does Allah say? So this is after, you know, subhanAllah, this is the way Qur'an is. You know, you never find that it just sticks to one, either just the threats or just the, uh, you know, um, uh, hope. It's not just, it's not either hope or fear in its entirety. You'll always find it's oscillating between both. Hope and fear, hope and fear. And this is the state of the believer. And subhanAllah, the believer is always between hope and fear. If you have too much fear, then you, you become hopeless. You become uh, paralyzed with fear. You don't do anything. If you have too much hope, you become arrogant, like a spoiled brat. You know, I'm gonna get whatever I want, so you know, you just become arrogant and become rude. And Allah Ta'ala keeps it between both. No, no, you have to fear and you have to have hope. You have to have hope in Allah's mercy, but fear of your own weaknesses and your own sin. So the, here comes the hope after that. What is it? وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ And he is the oft forgiving. Or the, the, a ghafur means the one who forgives big sins. It doesn't matter how big it is, as long as you sincerely repent, Allah is going to forgive. Al-Wadud. Al-Wadud means the affectionate, the one who is the most loving. The name of Allah, uh, Ghafoor, occurs 91 times in the Quran. SubhanAllah, 91 times just goes to show how often Allah Ta'ala is emphasizing what? That He is the one who is all forgiving. So anybody who comes to the masjid, or anybody, let's say, not in the masjid, who says to themselves, you know, oh, I'm so sinful, I shouldn't pray. I'm so sinful that God's never going to forgive me. I'm so sinful that I can never get better. SubhanAllah, Allah is all forgiving. And, and then says what? Al-Wadud, the one who loves passionately. Uh, this is mentioned because it is easy to forget Allah's intense love during hard times, right? This, is, this whole surah is talking about during hard times when the believers are being tested and they could think, maybe Allah doesn't love me. And Allah is saying, I love intensely. And this is just a test that you have to get through. This name of Allah, Al-Wadud, occurs twice in the Qur'an. Once here, wa huwa al wadud and also once in Surah Hud, ayah number 11, when Allah says, وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ إِنَّ رَبِّي رَحِيمٌ wadud. Then ask forgiveness of your Lord, and then repent to Him. Indeed, my Lord is merciful and affectionate. So what is the lesson? That Allah is always exceedingly loving. And the, one who, uh, the only question is, Will we turn to Him and receive that love or will, will we turn away? And the ways that we turn away is either by our own evils, as mentioned in Surah Hud, or uh, by the evils that others do to us, which makes us cynical and makes us lose hope, which is mentioned here in Surah Al-Buruj. So both of them are possible. We have to make sure that the, that the loss of uh, uh, hope in Allah's love doesn't come from within or from imposed on us by those who are doing evil to us. Al-Wadud, by the way, is an interesting name of Allah because this pattern of uh, can, can can refer to fa'il or maf'ul, either the active or the passive. So in other words, it can mean the loving, the one who loves intensely, but al-wadud also can mean what? The one who is the most loved. Because Allah Ta'ala is the one who is loved the most. Because we recognize that Allah is our creator, and everything that I love is ultimately coming from Him. So ultimately, all that love returns back to Allah. There's a very beautiful poem. Uh, it goes as follows. عَفُهُ يَسْتَغْرِقُ الذُّنُوبُ فَكَيْفَ حُبُّهُ وَحُبُّهُ يُضِيءُ الْقُلُوبُ فَكَيْفَ وُدُّهُ SubhanAllah, for those of you that can appreciate the Arabic, it sounds really nice in Arabic. I, didn't, I wasn't able to make it rhyme, maybe I can work on it inshallah, but uh, I didn't work on it, uh, and maybe one day I'll work on it, try to make it rhyme in, in English inshallah ta'ala, but I'll just translate it, it doesn't sound as nice in English. It says what? His forgiveness, Allah's forgiveness, His forgiveness drowns out sins, so what about His love? His love enlightens the hearts, so what about His affection? His affection confounds the minds. So what about his proximity? So subhanAllah, this is just describing the one who gets closer and closer to his creator and how beautiful it is that Allah is so loving and so forgiving and merciful and that you can always get closer and closer to your Lord. What's interesting here is that ghafur implies forgiving of big, big sins, as we mentioned. And wadud implies what? Having true love. The connection between them implies what? That even if you've committed terrible, terrible sins, you can sincerely turn back to Allah and it's not that Allah is going to begrudgingly forgive you. This is a thing that I think a lot of us think. We think I've done such a huge evil deed 
that even if I repent and Allah forgives me, it's not like it's not like a, a forgiveness that He wants to. It's like okay, fine, You're like okay, I forgive you, but you know I'm still kind of upset. No, Allah Taala is ghafurun wad wadud. The implication is what that His uh, uh, mercy or His excuse me His love is not reserved for only the most righteous people. It's actually for the ones who are make big mistakes, the huge sinners. So long as that person doesn't embrace that sin, so long as that person recognizes that those actions were wrong and they keep on repenting, even if you do big mistakes, Allah is saying, it's not just that I'll let it go, I'll actually love you. Isn't that something beautiful? Like think about that. If somebody does you wrong, if I scratch your car and you're like, okay bro, I forgive you for scratching my car, but deep down you're kind of like, I hate this guy, you know? Like, you, like you're, you're kind of upset. Like I can't believe you, I can't believe you messed up my car. Like I forgave him, I let it go. You know, I'm not gonna charge him anything, I'm not gonna take him to court, but you know, I don't feel good around this person, you know? But Allah Ta'ala is saying what? I forgive major sins and I love you. So it's not saying what? It's not saying that my love is only for the people who are perfect. No, no, that's not the case. It's love is for those who do big mistakes, but they repent. SubhanAllah, may Allah Ta'ala make us of those who are constantly repenting. I mean, furthermore, uh, uh, yes, love comes after forgiveness, forgiveness comes after repentance, and repentance comes after regret and reform. So let's always focus on trying to repent and regret and try to reform ourselves, and then inshallah ta'ala, that will cause repentance, and repentance causes forgiveness, and then forgiveness causes love. So this seems to be the, the, the cycle here. And also, it's also beautiful that uh, you can take these two ayat. It could be talking about what Allah begins, as in Allah begins this transformation inside of a person, changing their evil habits and making them righteous. But then they relapse. And then what happens? In a moment of weakness, they relapse. But then he turns back to them again. He returns to them again. Through repentance, through revelation, through, through, through coming back to this deen, they keep turning back. And so then therefore, he is forgiving and merciful. So it could, you could take it from the, from the beginning to the end. SubhanAllah, it's quite, or from these two ayat, it seems quite beautiful. Uh, just a few last points, inshallah ta'ala. One point that I want to make that is very, very important, I hope we all remember this, is that we don't have to wonder if Allah ta'ala is loving. This is not a question we have to wonder about because he describes himself as the most loving. So clearly Allah Ta'ala is loving. The question we need to ask ourselves is number one, do we love him? It's not does Allah love? Yes, Allah loves, but do we love him? And number two, how do we get his love? Because Allah loves, but does he love me? That's a different question. So SubhanAllah, beautifully, this is answered in one ayah of the Quran. Both of these questions are answered in one ayah in Surah uh, Ali Imran, ayah number 31. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمُ اللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah says what? Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say to the people, if you really love Allah, so we know Allah is loving, but the question is, do you love Him? So every, every, every religion is going to say yes. Everybody, everybody who has any religiosity is going to say, yes, I love God. You know, the Jew, the Christian, the this, the that. And they're all going to say, we love God. But Allah says what? If you truly love Allah, then follow me. In other words, you should follow the example and the prophetic model of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. This is, once you follow the prophetic model, then inshallah ta'ala, if you really love Allah, that's what you're going to do. You're going to follow his prophets. So say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me, yuhibbukum Allah, then Allah is going to love you. We know that he is loving, but does he love you? And do you really love him? If your love for him is true, you're going to follow the sunnah. And if you follow the lifestyle and the example, the prophetic model of the Prophet ﷺ, then indeed, inshallah ta'ala, Allah is going uh, to love, love you. And in addition to that, He's going to forgive whatever sins you make because we're all going to fall short. None of us are going to implement it perfectly. And this is the final point I want to say, is that because we covered the name uh, of Allah, which, uh, which, is, uh, which has the word dhu in it, right? Inshallah. Oh yeah, so, so excuse me, I have one more ayah I want to cover today. So Dhul Arsh al Majid, one more ayah. Allah says what? He calls himself Dhul Arsh al Majid. Dhu means what? The one who possesses. Al Arsh means the throne, and Al Majid means what? The honorable or majestic, you could say. And this is amazing because this is describing Allah Ta'ala as the most high and the most majestic, having the highest throne having the greatest, loftiest throne. And this is a throne, obviously, it's not like uh, the same way in our worldly sense. Obviously, this is beyond our comprehension, what this throne uh, looks like, or et cetera, how big it is. We, these questions don't apply. This is beyond our comprehension. But it is what? It is demonstrating royalty and grandeur and something so high above us and so great. Why would that follow up the mention that Allah Ta'ala is loving? Well, because you have to balance love and respect. See, the thing is, when you know that Allah is loving and forgiving, you might get arrogant. Right? You might start to say, he loves me, I'm no problem. You know, he loves me, I, I can do whatever I want. So you see this balancing act, subhanAllah, it's so beautiful. Dhul Arsh al-Majid, that Allah Ta'ala, what? He 
Uh, love can allow you to cross the line of respect, and sometimes respect can put somebody so high far above you that you don't feel like they love you. So these two together are perfectly balancing. So the idea is what? We all want to feel loved by others, but the thing is, the quality of the love matters as well. It's a very important point, right? Because you might be loved by your dog, right? Oh, my dog loves to see me, right? Let's say theoretically. But let's say your family members hate you. This, I mean, some, some people live like this, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, there are some people, we don't have dogs in our homes, but I'm just saying as an example, some people, they come home and, you know, they have the dog is so happy to see them, but the rest of the family, they don't love them. So the quality of the love is not the same. Sometimes you may have fans that love you, but your own family members don't love you. This is a bad situation. Allah Ta'ala is saying, I love you, but then he's reminding you who he is. His status is the highest of statuses. It's the most important love. Dhul Arsh al-Majid, he's from the highest, from above the seven heavens, subhanAllah. And so we just learned that Allah Ta'ala is wadud, but being loved by someone lowly isn't as special as being loved by somebody who is high in nobility and honor. So this verse lets us know how high Allah Ta'ala is. And also it's going to be contrasted in a moment with those who are tyrants and how they are uh, uh, you know, uh, tyrannical on the earth and how they do all sorts, sorts of evil. And so Allah Ta'ala is combining love and his authority, contrasting the various tyrannical oppressors uh, that are mentioned in this surah uh, that were, are going to come up in just a moment as well. There's a very beautiful quote from Imam Ahmed. It says, قِيلَ لِلْإِمَامْ أَحْمَدْ كَمْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ عَشْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ قَالَ دَعْوَةٌ صَادِقَةٌ مِنْ قَلْبٍ صَادِقٍ Imam, Imam Ahmed was once asked, what is the distance between us and the throne of the Most Merciful? So what is the distance? He has asking like a technical, like how many, you know, kilometers, miles, whatever. And he says in response, a sincere call from a sincere heart. You really want to know the distance between you and Allah, you and the throne of the Most Merciful? If you make one call sincerely from your heart, that is, that covers the distance just like that, subhanAllah. And then Allah says, Al-Majid. And the, this is a bit technical, but the word Majid could be Majidu or Majidi. It could be either Marfu' or uh, uh, Majroor. And the idea here is that it could be Dhul Arsh Majidu, referring to Al-Majid, Allah being the most majestic, or it could be Dhul Arsh Majidi, as in meaning the Arsh is what is majestic. Both are uh, acceptable in the language. Uh, uh, yes. And I want to mention that when it comes to the name of Allah, names of Allah, this is the final point, inshallah, when Allah Ta'ala describes himself with Dhu, which meaning the possessor of, uh, you'll find that it falls into three categories. Uh, descriptions of Allah that are associated with His names. So for example, in the Qur'an, we have Dhul Quwa, related, related to the name Al Qawi, right? Allah is the most powerful. Dhul Quwa means the possessor of power. This is mentioned twice in the Qur'an. Also, Dhul Rahmah, the possessor of mercy, like Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, mentioned uh, Dhul Rahmah, mentioned three times in the Qur'an. And then you have Dhul Maghfirah, the possessor of forgiveness. This is mentioned once in the Quran and is obviously associated to Ghafar, Ghafur, Ghafir, and so forth. So these are descriptions of Allah that are associated with His names. However, then you have descriptions of Allah that aren't associated with the name, like for example, Dhul Tawr, the owner of abundance. Then you have Dhul Fadl. This is mentioned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times in the Quran, subhanAllah. And this is, yes, Dhul Fadl. It mentioned twelve, the, the, the possessor of all virtue. And Dhul Jalali Wal Ikram mentioned twice in the Quran. Uh, as we talked about, we covered this uh, in a previous session about the names of Allah. Then you have what? Descriptions of Allah that are actions. Dhu Dhu Riqab uh, Alim, the, the possessor of a severe punishment, and Dhu Intiqam, the possessor of vengeance, taking vengeance of those who are wicked. I mentioned four times in the Quran. And then you have possessor of what? D uh, 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 an actual creation of Allah. Dhul Arsh and Dhul Ma'arij. These are mentioned in the Quran as well. So I just thought it's an interesting breakdown as to all the names of Allah that mention, or the descriptions of Allah that have Dhu, the possessor, and how they are broken up into different categories for those of you that are interested in these things. Barakallahu feekum. Inshallah, we'll continue and finish off this surah, uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.